Welcome to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. I'm your host, Molly Watts. If you want to change your drinking habits and create a peaceful relationship with alcohol, you're in the right place. This podcast explores the strategies I use to overcome a lifetime of family alcohol abuse, more than 30 years of anxiety and worry about my own drinking, and what felt like an unbreakable daily drinking habit. Becoming an alcohol minimalist means removing excess alcohol from your life so it doesn't remove you from life. It means being able to take alcohol or leave it without feeling deprived. It means to live peacefully, being able to enjoy a glass of wine without feeling guilty and without needing to finish the bottle. With science on our side, we'll shatter your past patterns and eliminate your excuses. Changing your relationship with alcohol is possible. I'm here to help you do it. Let's start now. Well, hello and welcome or welcome back to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast with me, your host, Molly Watts, coming to you from, well, it's a little gray. It's a little cloudy. It's a little rainy. It's a little haley. It's a little everything around Oregon this last few days. On uh, Sunday, we had a tornado touchdown just just south of us, not a big one, but a little one and a water spout. It's just been some crazy cold air front, I guess, that is causing some weird weather around here. But the weather forecast tells me that in honor of summer officially starting here in the next day or so, we are back to sunny weather and 80 degrees. I am very much looking forward to that. Hey, I have just a couple of housekeeping notes here before we jump into this week's episode. First and foremost, I want to invite you to join me on my More Dry July Challenge. That's More Dry July. It isn't doesn't have to be a full 31 days dry. It doesn't have to be anything other than what you're doing right now. I just want you to add in a few more alcohol-free days. I want it to make it more dry than you normally do, all right? And you can join me and you can get 60 days free on Sunnyside. Sunnyside is the mindful drinking app that I that I work with, that I many of my clients use, and it's just a great tool for helping you plan ahead, making that doable drink plan, and also for tracking your progress and also some just motivation along the way. And 60 days free with no credit card required. You can join me at getsunnyside.co slash molly. That's getsunnyside.co slash molly to join me for the more dry July challenge. Do it. Do it today. All right. Other thing is, you may have heard me mention a few weeks ago that I was trying to get up to 100 reviews of the podcast on Apple Podcasts specifically. And typically, I have a prize winner every other week for some alcohol minimalist swag. This week, I have two because I have my regular winner and then I have my honorary 100th episode or 100th podcast review on Apple Podcasts. So first and foremost, the winner of my just regular alcohol minimalist swag this week comes to me from Audible. Yes, you can you can review on Audible and I will be added into the mix. This is Chris Daly. This is what Chris had to say. Before discovering her book, I discovered Molly's podcast. One could say that I discovered Molly at just the right time in my life. Like many during the pandemic, I noticed my wine consumption had been creeping up. Some of the case was the crazy time we were and to an extent are still living through, although not everything. What worked for me was picking up Molly's podcast from the most recent episode whilst going back and listening to all of her podcasts until both the beginning and the end of the series came together. Since I have a somewhat eclectic palette of mostly Southern Hemisphere reds, I knew I did not want to totally quit, although I knew I was consuming more than I thought I should. Listening to Molly's podcast and using other resources, I thankfully realized I am not alone and have sort of found a large community of similar people. Through the Alcohol Minimalist podcast, I have learned many totally doable strategies and Molly backs everything with science, all while delivering the information with a very relatable, likable voice, such that the podcast feels more like a touch base with a trusted friend or accountability partner. Thank you, Molly, for all the people whose lives you have touched in such a positive way. Ah, thanks, Chris. Thank you so, so very much. 
email me, molly at mollywatts.com. Let me know that you heard this and that you are the regular Alcohol Minimalist swag winner. And the other person is Remy Kelly. Remy Kelly, you left a review on Apple Podcasts and you were number 100. So Remy Kelly, if you are listening, email me molly at mollywatts.com and I will send you out your big prize, which is uh, a whole set of my Five for Life planners. Um, I'll explain it to you more in that email, but it's a full year's worth of planners and journals that you can use because we we talk all about writing things down all the time around here. So give me, uh, email me and I will send that out to you as well. All right. That is all I've got for housekeeping. We are now on to this week's show. And I have a special guest today. This is a interview that I recorded with Rory Kinsella. And Rory is a writer and Vedic meditation teacher based in Sydney, Australia. He also was a former very hard drinking musician and journalist. And he quit drinking back in 2017, and he now teaches, and he has created something called the Wise Monkey Way. (laughs) And basically, he helps people change their relationship with alcohol through meditation. And he teaches this in a way that is really effortless, using a mantra, and helps people move past right thoughts to a place of stillness within that's what he says in his in his stuff so it's called the wise monkey way and this is the thing i just want you to know i bring guests on the show that have their own programs that do their own thing that 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 you could go explore outside of me right because what's most important to me is that i want you to find what works for you to change your relationship with alcohol so whether that's my programs whether that's my coaching whether that's my podcast or someone else that's doing great work that's what i want you to know about and so you're going to hear from people that do things you know like like rory who someone would say well he competes with you well yeah of course but does he really? (laughs) I mean, he does things completely differently than me. And I think it's great. And if this works for you, then I want you to know about it. So please enjoy my conversation with Rory Kinsella. Make it a great day, everyone. And I'll see you next week. Hey, Rory, thank you so much for being here and being a guest on the Alcohol Minimalist podcast. I cannot wait to share the wise monkey way with my listeners. Thank you very much, Molly. Lovely to be here. And I'm looking forward to our chat. Yeah. Yeah. Lovely to be here. And let's just get this out of the way. Here is not anywhere near me (laughs) (laughs) or any of typically like, well, I do have quite a few listeners over there in Australia. So we are recording this. We're 17 something, I think 17 hours apart, something like that. So (laughs) it's been a little bit of a challenge to get us on the same time page. Give me a little bit about you and how you ended up in this particular space. And before we get going, folks, the Wise Monkey Way is a meditation practice that is designed to help people change their relationship with alcohol, kind of like I talk about, but specifically not just for completely stopping drinking, though that's what you do. And but for people that are like me that may just want to cut back or reduce the amount that they're drinking in their lives as well, right? Yeah. So, well, hello from tomorrow. It's it's the day <laughs> after for me. I'm in a, right? I'm in Sydney, Australia. I'm originally from the UK, if anyone's getting uh, confused about my accent. <laughs> but yeah, my thing is that I, I bring meditation to people who want to drink less. And whether that is to drink you know, not every day or to drink less or to only drink on social occasions or whether it is to not drink anything. Um, I show them how to use meditation as a tool to help them get there. Mm-hmm. And this is really answering uh, a job that many people assign to alcohol, which is to relax me, to stop my mind, my busy mind thinking. So I and I'll talk about my experience and what led me to do this. But but yeah, my thing is that I teach people how to meditate specifically for the purpose of reducing their dependence on alcohol or their need to their habitual need to drink regularly so that they can live more full, more happy 
our lives with better sleep with um you know more creativity and all all the benefits that meditation brings. because guess what meditation brings lots of <laughs> benefits yeah on their right. own so i really like how it gets people from you know the reason they might come to wise monkey way is to uh, reduce their their alcohol or to stop drinking but then they often they're like hey you know meditation does all these other things it's it's a proper spiritual journey and you know they find people find themselves developing in all these other areas of their life which you know i think uh, it sets me apart from some other programs it just doesn't it doesn't stop with the alcohol stopping there's what meditation yeah. will, will, will open up all these other doors yeah Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, because meditation is one of those tools, in my opinion, that we can all benefit from, whether we're drinking or not, right? Because just to your point, it is something that has been shown over and over and over again to have so many therapeutic elements, so many beneficial things. It, it improves longevity, folks. It, it actually literally has been scientifically proven to increase longevity. So there's excellent reasons to practice meditation. And I know you're going to get there because one of the things that I'm really excited to, to hear from you on is this is meditation that is supposed to be geared for people that think they're too busy, their brain is too active, that that literally meditation feels like, oh, there's no possible way I like cannot sit still and not do anything for 10 minutes. Like that sounds like you know, just torture to me, or that's what they think. And right. Is that, is that, am I, am I correct in that? Yeah. So this is one of the, the, the main misconceptions that people have about meditation. It's, and it's my, my day-to-day -day job to be like, Hey, <laughs> don't worry. Meditation <laughs> not, doesn't have to be that way, but it's this, this perception that is, you know, permeated through, through, our society that meditation is about clearing your mind and that if you can't instantly clear your mind even though you've never done this thing before then you're a failure and you might as well give up and you know there's some special special people who can do it and, and some other people who can't so what i like to to do is really bust those myths around meditation and say well look we don't meditate so that we can instantly clear our minds we meditate so that we can allow all that crap that's 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 in there <laughs> to run around and let off steam so that we feel calmer and more in control afterwards. And this is why meditation. So, so it's about teaching people that you sitting down and having lots of thoughts isn't, isn't a sign that you can't meditate. It's actually a symptom that meditation is something that you need. It's like people who say, Hey, look, I'm way too unfit to exercise. It's like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> right. If, you, if you've got a busy mind, that's like, hey, well, what, what could you do about that? And a simple Google search will show that ways to deal with an overactive or over busy mind is to meditate. Now, it just means that you have to get through that, that uncomfortable sensation of not being able to control something. So it's really about realigning people's expectations about what meditation is supposed to be like. And if you manage to sit there for you know, 15 minutes is my standard amount for people starting out. If you sit there for 15 minutes, despite what happens in your mind, uh, you will feel calmer afterwards. And in my experience from my participants, you will be less likely to need a drink. Yeah. So specifically by putting that meditation. So meditation, you can do it in the morning. You can do it in the afternoon i tend to recommend people if they're just doing one a day to do it in that witching hour end of the work day time mm -hmm. and say well look this was this may have been your habit before say for daily drinkers where the working day is over or you know a chunk of the day is over and you're about to you know go right i've earned to put my feet up and have a glass of wine i would say well hey before doing that why don't you meditate and that is going to give you what and just experiment and see if that if that does give you what you want, which is the reward you want is to stop thinking about work and to sit and you know not do anything or to not be looking after your screaming children or whatever it might be. Um, so to say, look, we, we meditate to improve our lives. We don't meditate to, you know, master a certain experience within the meditation. So I just say, well, look, sit down take judgment off yourself don't you know don't uh no one's marking you no one's saying hey you know molly's really rubbish at this she she should give up 
like no one's there looking over your shoulder going no no you did that wrong you did that wrong which is different to say if I was learning to play golf or tennis for example people would be able to see me but this is an internal thing that we're doing we just need to we need to practice it and it's this lovely word that's embedded in this technique is that it's a practice and no one ever masters this I've been meditating twice a day for the last nine years and I haven't mastered it I still practice it every day and part of practicing it is uh being forgiving myself for let for my mind wandering but what I benefit from allowing my mind to wander and having this quiet time in my day is that whatever my day throws at me I'm more able to cope with it so the, the concept that we talk about in meditation is adaptation energy and adaptation energy is a product of how rested you are so if you get a good night's sleep you, you're on a you're on a uh, a good footing but as the day goes through and you know different things happen uh, then you're going to lose that adaptation energy and the way that I see that in terms of people who drink is that once you're out of that adaptation energy then you're moving to your coping mechanism which you know in this example is is drinking and what meditation does is it tops that adaptation energy back up, which means that you can then cope with more things. So you're, ne you, you're less needing of th those kind of crutches. I love this. I'm so excited to, I, I, again, I'm, this is just such a powerful tool in so many ways for the people that are listening to, to this show, because we talk about all the time about this, the idea that what you're actually looking for is not the drink in the bottle, but you're looking for whatever feeling you think you're going to get out of that, right? So when you're looking for relaxed, this is another alternative. And because that's one of the things we need, we actually need something. If you take away the coping mechanism that you've used for years and years and years, and don't have something to replace it with, that is more beneficial, you will you know, you could potentially turn to something else that's equally not as good for you, right? So you could do other things. So this is why meditation, this example is so awesome. You got here because of what? So how did you end up becoming a Vedic meditation teacher and somebody that also is 100% alcohol free, right? Yeah, so it was, it was a very natural process for me and kind of unfolded organically but I guess my drinking story starts with you know being a teenager in the UK and they let people in the pubs quite early yeah you you UK. Brits like to to get your your drink on pretty early don't you <laughs> well yeah so sorry like... <laughs> sorry everybody that's listening over there but this is this is a long-standing story that I hear from my from my UK clients Oh, yeah. So I I'm, I mean, I was drinking at 12, 13, 14. Yeah. I was drinking in pubs at 15, you know, with my fake ID. And it was it's very normalized and it's very kind of encouraged. And the Brits, you know, like Aussies as well and, and Kiwis and, and many other nationalities and, you know, obviously parts of the US, there is this culture of binge drinking and drinking to excess. Mm. So that was my 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 thing. And I was uh at school and at university or you know university is like a it's like boarding school with with a cheap bar <laughs> so I, I drank all the way through there and it was very normal and it, and uh, and uh when I left university I, I was I ended up falling into multiple industries where alcohol is very common and the more I work in this space the more I realized that every, you know so many industries they're like oh engineers all big drinkers lawyers yeah all big drinkers doctors ooh, they're the worst <laughs> but <laughs> right i was i was a uh so i was a musician so i was a kind of semi semi-professional mm -hmm. musician in bands touring around the uk and in europe this is in the early 2000s i was a dj and club promoter um and then when i had to get a proper job i was a music journalist which isn't really a proper job but <laughs> was still in that sphere of you know interviewing famous people and you know it's not just accepted that people drink it's kind of encouraged it's 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 lionized like you're cool if you stumble into work when, when I used to work in London stumble into work at midday you know they they're kind of pretending that they're annoyed with you but it's like yeah <laughs> you're yeah. You're, yeah. you're doing so that was that was my whole 20s and then I moved to Australia when I was 31. I'm still working in the media. And I got to a point when I hit 
35 when I had what I call my early midlife crisis where uh, the, the I guess as we were saying before this using alcohol as a tool so I used it as a tool to relax and I used it as a tool to be more outgoing I'm naturally an introvert and what I found is that it was not doing that as successfully like I'd be getting super drunk to this to the state where I'd go mute so I'd be drinking so I could be all sociable and you know chat to girls and everything like that and then I'd be so wasted that I couldn't speak um and you know we would be partying and doing doing uh recreational drugs and and all that so I reached this point on my 35th birthday where I was like I can't carry on like this I don't want to be a 65 year old DJ playing in bars on a Friday night so I that was when I started making changes and I I decided that the, the the main culprit was DJing. So I gave up DJing and smoking. Oh and I I didn't even, you know, start thinking about alcohol for for a couple of years after that. But started making some changes because because I, I could see that, you know, this was a, a bit of a midpoint and I didn't want to continue doing this. And I was getting less, you know, I wasn't enjoying it. So I was getting less of that return on investment for these huge nights out that I was having that, that would cost me four days of recovery. You know, I'd be mm. still there on Thursday going, oh my God, this is so painful. I was like, I can't keep doing this. So from that point on my 35th birthday, I started making a few changes. Like I started getting fit and I became a marathon runner and I started looking into different things. Like I did all the personality tests you can do at work and I did a neuro-linguistic programming course and I was like dabbling in all these self-help type uh, areas and then uh, a mentor I had at work suggested meditation so I was like okay that sounds cool this is <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting to change myself but I don't really know what I'm changing myself into but I know I don't want to be that party monster anymore that's not sustainable so I I started looking around at meditation I tried different techniques and you know, as as any of your listeners would know, if they've looked out there, there are lots of different styles. And I'd actually been put off meditation from about 10 years earlier when we'd done this. Uh, my, my old boss at one of my music journalism jobs was this crazy hippie dude who in the morning he would be like, right, everyone, we are going to meditate. And he wouldn't give us any instruction, but he would just say, close your eyes and meditate. So with no instruction, I was following the what what any anyone in the street would do, which is try and clear my mind, which is like, okay, I'm supposed to not think. And I'd be like, I'm thinking, what's, you know, who am I going to call after this? What's, what's, you know, what's for dinner tonight? You know, what's on TV? Thinking all these crazy thoughts with no instruction of what I was supposed to do. So I concluded, as many people do when they don't learn properly, that I was no good at this. My mind was too busy to meditate. And you can imagine the scene, there's lots of like these, sales guys hanging around who aren't really paying attention to this they're rolling joints or throwing paper airplanes at each other <laughs> um so from that I was like right this isn't for me I can't do this so that kind of put me off a little bit but then when 10 years later I was like okay look I'm going to give this another go I dived into it and learned that there are lots of these different techniques so I, I sampled as many as I could like I did a mindfulness course and I did staring at a candle meditation and I did the you know compassion meditation where I uh brought my beloved cat to mind and then sent all sent this love to myself and then to my enemies and all these these different techniques and I started to feel different I started to have more energy but I hadn't found a technique that I really loved until about six months later I found Vedic meditation which is the technique that I now teach and the difference with Vedic meditation I kind of felt right away and it was more of a visceral thing where I felt myself relax and I felt oh wow this just this this is doing if I was looking for say alcohol to do this job of relax me and make me feel comfortable in my skin I got that kind of instantly with Vedic meditation and the way Vedic meditation works differently to say mindfulness so for those who don't know much about meditation if you've come across any it's probably mindfulness so this is breath meditation so like the calm app or the headspace app and this is where you generally bring your awareness to your breath there are other techniques but the main one is the breath mm -hmm. and and you often sit upright and you're often taught by monks it's from a monastic tradition 
um and that the headspace guy for example was a monk for 10 yeah. years he was my hero yeah okay. <laughs> i've heard his story before he's pretty that's pretty he's pretty crazy he's a brit yeah too, right yeah he's he's british he is. someone told me the yeah. other day that my my voice sounds like his we're both from the same yeah. hometown so. yeah you do sound a little similar you do <laughs> Well, what I discovered with Vedic meditation is that, uh, you know, on, on a different uh, lineage to that mindfulness Buddhist tradition, there was another tradition which w- is characterized by being, they call it a householder tradition. So if one is a monastic tradition where you're often taught by monks and it's designed for monks, this other tradition is is for householders, householders and householders being people with jobs and relationships and worldly ambitions who aren't, you know, tending their monastery garden all day. And I, and I really liked how this was, was described. And rather than, you know, sitting in Lotus pose, not that you have to sit in Lotus pose for mindfulness, but it's more of that idea of sitting up straight and using concentration and focus with Vedic meditation. It was, it's, it's designed to be, we describe it as effortless, now effortless is easier said than done but this is this is what <laughs> sounds <we're>, good <laughs> we're aiming at and you know like you're yeah. sitting back in your office chair I've, I've got back on my chair here too and this is what we do we, it's, we sit much more like we would to watch Netflix or or read a book and you know you can quite recline you, you don't have your head resting back but apart from that you super chilled and then you Rather than using the breath, we use what we call a a mantra. So a mantra is a word or sound that we repeat silently in our heads to bring us to a place of stillness. So, you know, not a million miles away from the breath. So in in all of these techniques, we're basically saying, I don't want to be in my head going, what's going to happen at that meeting tomorrow? Am I going to get fired? You know, all these things that might be going through your head and making you anxious. You know, we often speculate about the future which is not going to be uh it's not going to be relaxing for us to speculate about about things that haven't happened or to um ruminate on things that have happened in the past so in all all meditation techniques we say well look i want to put my mind on something neutral so the breath being something neutral what i preferred about the the mantra technique is it just seemed it seemed to to work more easily for me and it was it was like with the breath, you can go, I can focus on my belly rising and falling or I can focus on my chest or I can focus on the breath going in and out of my nostrils. And I found that there was too many things that I could be thinking about for that. And I could also quite successfully carry on a conversation while paying attention to my breath. And I was a smoker for 20 years. So I was thinking, oh, what is in my lungs anyway? It's, it's going to be all black. <laughs> um, so w- w- I found the mantra much more soothing and it had much more of an, uh, an immediate effect of bringing me to this place of stillness. And the other thing with the difference between the two is that m- mindfulness, it takes you out of your head into your body, which is, which is relaxing for you because you're not speculating and, and working yourself up. What the householder techniques like Vedic meditation do is they take you into the mantra but then the mantra leads you to this place of ultimate stillness inside where you what we call transcend so you move beyond thinking into a place of pure inner stillness which sounds pretty cool (laughs) um and what the, the benefit of doing that and or at least even moving towards that is that when we come out of meditation we are we are more able to cope with things. So, right, we, we've, we've, instead of sitting there worrying about what might happen tomorrow, instead we've, we've relaxed our bodies more deeply even than when we're sleeping. So this is a really cool fact about meditation is that the body rests in terms of its metabolic rate. So the amount you're breathing um, is lower in meditation than when you're sleeping, which means that your body can rest that much more deeply so that, you can then be rejuvenated and top up that rest that maybe you didn't get because you didn't sleep amazingly for whatever reason, which means you can then cope with your day much better, which means that then you're less likely to go and grab a drink. So I I learned this technique uh, and this was in 2014. And it really helped me 
cope with my life better and started opening up different possibilities to me. And, and although I didn't quit drinking for another um, three years after that, I immediately noticed a change where I didn't have to drink. You know, it was much more of a choice. And I used to be very much a people pleaser, a rubber arm drinker. Like if anyone wanted to go out on a Wednesday and have drinks for no reason, I would be there. If anyone wanted to do shots of, you know, Patron, I was there. And, you know, I, I prided myself on being the last man standing often. And I found that, you know, even because I kept a journal at the time, even the week after I learned to meditate, I was saying, hey, no, I'm not going to come to that or I'm going to come. I'm going to have two soft drinks because it's a Wednesday and I've got work tomorrow. And I know that I'm not going to stop at two drinks like other people would stop at two drinks. And I'd find myself at the casino at three in the morning because it was the only place <laughs> open right. to drink. So that that meant I was able to reduce some of that drinking and that's that for me that was that was great and that's what I, I I how I introduce it as a first step to people it's like well look I'm not you know it's don't want to scare you off and say look you need to quit drinking immediately it's like well let's get rid of the the, the drinking that you're not getting any benefit from let you know let's 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 say that people are getting benefit from some of their drinking there'll be some that they're not like that midweek right a half or whole bottle of wine which is just automatic while watching the tv we're going to get rid of that crappy drinking because we're going to give you a different tool for that mm -hmm. and we're going to give you more mental clarity because what does meditation do it clears out all the stress in your mind so that you are more able to take in more information you're more able to see the clear lay of the land which for me meant that i was like well, I like this. I'm going to learn more and more about this technique. And two years later, I was like, well, this is something I'm really passionate about. I'm not this passionate about my job. So let me let me learn how to teach it. So I learned how to teach it. And I was still drinking at this point, but I kind of cut it down to only occasionally. So I might drink every two weeks, but because all of my friends, or well, many of my friends are, are all Brits here too, they're all bingers. So I found it very hard to, to moderate I could moderate the number of times that I drank, but I found it hard to moderate how much I drank on a night out because the the environment was very, let's mm -hmm. do shots. We, my One of my best friends is called Dr. Tequila. <laughs> so he, <laughs> his prescription was always tequila. Um, so so I, I cut down and, and while, while I was learning to teach this technique, and then once I'd, I'd qualified as a teacher, uh, I was finding ways to, to, you know, excite people about meditation. And what I realized after I started, um, well, actually, no, let me, let me skip back. So, so a year and a half into that, I then went on a meditation retreat, which was in Mexico. It was, it was, it was the year of my 40th and I was single. And I was like, what do single people with a bit of money from work do on new year i was like i'm gonna go on a meditation retreat in mexico <laughs> so i went on this <laughs> went on this retreat and i ended up in a in a room a shared room with three other guys who were all 40 that year all single all who had this idea of let's go <laughs> and meditate but but what i got from that week of intense vedic meditation was this this kind of big step change of clarity where i went hey i could just not drink that would make things so much easier and there was a there was a a, a yoga teacher on that trip a lady called claire robbie who's who's a kiwi and she provided the first example to me of someone who was like normal <laughs> but had nice. chosen not to drink so she'd given up a year before and I was like, oh, because I didn't have any examples of that around me. Like none of my friends had, had given up. And I guess I I had the idea of you're either an alcoholic in the gutter and then you have to give up mm. or you just, you know, um, knuckle down and, and keep going and, and, and grit and grit, grit your teeth through those hangovers. You all know I'm a science girl, and that is why I am so proud of my partnership with Sunnyside. Sunnyside has great data based on their user experience, and they also have great science techniques behind what drives the program in the first place. 
Users of Sunnyside in their first 30 days experience on average a 29% reduction in drinks. They avoid 1,500 calories and they've saved over $50 each month. This is because there is science behind the program. Sunnyside helps you reach your goals and stick with them long term by focusing on three scientifically proven superpowers. One is pre commitment. You intentionally make a plan ahead of time, and we talk about making a plan all the time here on the podcast. Number two is conscious interference, and you'll learn that the habit of tracking each drink helps you decide about it. Number three is positivity. We know this is not easy sometimes, right? And we all need a little boost. I try to be a boost, and Sunnyside is a great boost via text message or email to keep you motivated. So if you haven't already checked it out, I invite you, www.sunnyside.co slash molly to get started on a free 15-day trial today. So we had this week of not drinking, and this was in New Year in 2017, 2018. And then I got back to Sydney and I was like, okay, well, I could easily just go back into my normal drinking here, but I'm just going to try not drinking for a few more weeks like I, I felt so good I felt amazing after this week and just this idea of having a possibility of not having to have those four-day hangovers and I was also feeling it was a little bit incompatible with my new kind of meditation teacher vibe to be like yeah sometimes I get battered <laughs> <laughs> and I stay up till eight in the morning it's like it it didn't it didn't align with with what I was doing so so I guess it had given me this clarity to to break out of these old habits. And then I had this role model of of this lady, Claire, who was a normal person who just decided not to because she preferred it and she she had more energy. So I did a dry January in 2018, which is a bit of a, a weird thing to do in Australia because it's in the middle of the it's, summer. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right. It's yeah, you guys usually do dry July or I think there's more the yeah, dry July. Yeah. So we, I did dry January, and that in that month, I so I did the dry January, and we have Australia Day here, which I guess is like Fourth of July, which is a big boozy thing. I also had a wedding that I went to in New Zealand. At the end of that month, I was like, okay, well, I've done these big, what would have been drinking things, and I got through them, and I just decided to push it on. And in that next month, I had a few other things, like I went on a ski holiday in in Japan and it was like karaoke and these you know big boozy nights and I got through all of those and I was like well hang on if I can do all these things like specifically those Australia day a wedding and a ski holiday if I can get through those and I enjoyed them and I didn't you know I didn't ruin myself from drinking that really inspired me to to keep going and then through that process of 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 stopping I was writing about uh writing about my journey because I I've, have been a journalist. So, and I found that people were really interested, much more interested in my giving up drinking story than they had been in just a pure meditation mm. yeah. thing. Because there's a certain amount of people who who would be interested in pure meditation. But when I tied it in with, with drinking and how, how it helped me, uh, you know, uh, in, in, you know, th some of those jobs that went to alcohol could now be done with, with um meditation i got lots of interest around that and decided to 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 start presenting meditation in this way and it's like people will get all these other benefits from meditation but it's a way of getting people in so as meditation teachers we're always like you know if if i'm in uh, a corporate thing i'll be like you know this is good for helping you see clearly how the business is performing performing or if right. you're speaking to athletes it's like well this is your way of getting a competitive edge over your competitors so there's always like a right. way in but then everyone will get all the benefits of meditation right. so over the last five years since I quit I've been building a, a program around this where it's meditation is, is at the foundation of it and you know giving other people other ways of looking at drinking and moderating and and, and thinking about their limiting beliefs and all those those other psychological ways of looking at drinking but having it as a way because I was like well look it, as a meditation teacher what what am I what's my speciality and if if we think of 
experts being people who've got 10,000 hours experience. I was like, I've definitely got 10,000 hours of drinking experience. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an yeah. expert. In this. I can relate to that. Yeah, I definitely had that that number. Yeah. So that really made me think that, you know, I could I can offer real value here by, you know, using meditation as a way to, to help people change their relationship with alcohol. And since doing that, I've run, I have a recorded version of my course that, you know, thousands of people have done. And then I also do live online groups, which then brings into play the whole community aspect, which, you know, many other programs have shown that the value of that, of people going on the same journey. But I guess, yeah, my my speciality is saying, well, look, all those things are great. Community works. Thinking about your why, all of those things work. We will do all of those. But we will say, look, we're going to get you meditating as well because that's going to really make it so much easier for you. So if we're, if we're changing our thinking, we can think of that as being, that's a software update if we want to give like a computer mm-hmm. analogy, whereas meditation is going to give you a hardware update mm-hmm. as well. And, you know, so there's been many studies into meditation, but the one that I like the most is this 2012 study from Harvard, where this uh, this um, professor called Sarah Lazar, she had all these kind of yoga friends who were talking about, you know, anecdotally talking about the benefits of meditation, yoga and meditation. And and she was like, yes, but is it actually doing anything (laughs) physically? So she wanted, she's a neuroscientist, so she wanted to look at the brain and to say, well, look, is it just a placebo? Are you just, you know, making yourself feel better by by ticking this box? And what she found over eight weeks of people meditating was that there were these distinct changes in the brain, which links to what I'm talking about, hardware changes. And those, you know, I'm not a neuroscientist, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to describe this perfectly, but in a very simple way, two parts of the brain changed, one of which is the the, the prefrontal cortex, which is the part the, at the we top of your... We prefrontal cortex around here all the time. So <laughs> okay, well, you... yeah. <laughs> okay so you know what I'm talking about. So with with the meditators, they, they their prefrontal cortex got thicker. So more, more neurons, like we're making that wise part of our brain thicker. We're empowering that part. And we're upgrading the hardware there. And the other part that changed was the amygdala which is the fight or flight part of the brain part of the lizard brain uh which is more the instant gratification monkey so i talk about the wise monkey and the instant gratification monkey Mm -hmm. but that got smaller so over that eight eight week period people were changing their brains to have more of that part of the brain that helps them make good decisions and think about future consequences and things like that and and less of that instant gratification survival instinct part of their brain so that um, if you lay that on top of a desire to drink less you're going to be much more empowered to do that plus you know the software update of changing your limiting beliefs and having your why and having the community it, it is a real really powerful package to 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 help people on their way yeah This is awesome. Yeah, I agree. I mean, we do, that's kind of what I talk about all the time over here is that software update, but also that, yeah, we have to be able to improve the, the hardware, the the brain itself. And we can actually do that by doing things like meditation, doing other positive, you know, I talk about positive brain health, all sorts of different ways, whether it's uh, taking walks outside, because honestly, there's, there's, Again, science that shows that the power of being outside in sunlight is really good for us. All of these kind of things, exercise. We talked about, you talked about fitness. I mean, again, it's one of those things, Cardi, if it's good for your heart, it's good for your brain, right? So all of this, it matters. And tell people, Rory, where they can find you. Where's the easiest place to connect with Rory Kinsella? Yeah, so the the first place to start is wisemonkeyway.com. So just Chuck, Chuck Wise Monkey Way in Google and you'll find everything yep. I offer. Um, yeah, and you can also find me on Instagram as Rory Kinsella Meditation. I, I have some free uh, trial things you can go for. So if you go to Wise Monkey Way, I do a, a, a mini masterclass, which is yep. three meditations to, to, to let you try this. And, and part of 
the first one is to say, look, allow yourself to be bad at this. Like I wouldn't turn up at the golf range and expect to be amazing day one. Right. So it's like it's giving yourself permission to be bad. Like you're you're going to be new at this. So allow yourself to be bad because that helps you progress. And the way we judge success is not through whether you could get some uh, idealized version of what you think meditation is, but how did it make you feel afterwards? Like are you, when people do their first class with me, I also t- teach in person here in Sydney. It's like, well, how do you feel? How do you feel after? And they're always like, I feel great. I feel really calm. It's like, great. <laughs> you can right. feel like that much more often. Let's put one of those in the morning, one of those in the, in the evening. That's the ideal way to do it. And then see how your life changes you know, set intentions around drinking, but number one is prioritize meditation. It's going to make a huge difference because it's just not compatible. Those, those kinds of behaviors aren't compatible with the kind of consciousness that you generate through meditating regularly. Like it's very rare that you would see uh, a long-term meditator who was a heavy drinker or a smoker or had, you know, lots of other bad um, habits because it's just not compatible because you can see too clearly um so if we prioritize daily meditation we're going to get to that but to get people in the door it's like well just try it you know see see how it makes you feel you can put your feet up you can you know practice this effortless technique where you're not judging yourself for how you're performing but you're saying well look did i feel calmer afterwards and on your i think it may be on your main website i saw too you actually you actually have like a hangover meditation So if people have not got to that point yet where they're needing a little bit of help with over drinking still, there's, there's a resource for that too. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, um, it's on YouTube. You can just type in hangover meditation or anxiety meditation. That was one of my, my, my early breakthroughs that, that made me think, well, Hey, people are interested in this. Like it's got, I don't know, 60,000 views or something. And it actually got picked up all over the world by various media organizations because nice. it, it was like, you know, it's kind of who's this stupid meditation teacher saying that you can cure your hang- hangover in 11 minutes. And I was like, well, I didn't say you could completely cure it. Like if you're feeling sick, you're still going to feel sick, but it's going to make you feel a lot better and going to remove the guilt and the shame that you might be feeling and start to, you know, remove the, those some of those psychological aspects and make you feel calmer. It's not going to stop you know, your liver will still have to process what it's got. If you're going right. to vomit, it's still going to vomit. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, that's a good point awesome. to look at. This has been a blast, Rory. Thank you so much for being here. And I know that many of my my listeners are going to check you out and check out The Wise Monkey Way. I will link everything in the show notes, folks, so no worries. And Rory Kinsella, have a great afternoon and evening, <laughs> yeah. I think, great. right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, Molly. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for listening to the Alcohol Minimalist Podcast. This podcast is dedicated to helping you change your drinking habits and to create a peaceful relationship with alcohol. Use something you learned in today's episode and apply it to your life this week. Transformation is possible. You have the power to change your relationship with alcohol now. For more information, please visit me at www.mollywatts.com.